it's 10 o'clock, so I will go ahead and call the meeting to order. The chair notes there's a quorum present and we will do the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we go into the agenda, I just um, wanted to do something really quickly. Um, in recognition of the passing of County Judge Bill Hardy and his service to the people of Gillum County, I'd like to ask the county court to join me in observing a moment of silence. All right. I'm sure if you and Les Brooks are causing all kinds of trouble. <laughs> well, if they did as a county court. <laughs> um, going into 2.0, additions or revisions to the agenda. Pat, I think you had wanted us to add a uh, vaccination for promotion, NCPHD. Promotion from the North Central Public Health. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and add that at the beginning of unfinished business. So it'll be like 7.1a. And then under 7.5, um, I'll go ahead and give a frontier telenet update as well. That was gonna be what? A frontier telenet update. I've forgotten that we were going to meet yesterday and or we did meet yesterday and I've made a commitment to keeping everybody updated about those meetings. So any other additions or revisions? I don't have any. Okay. I like you guys. Um, then let's go into correspondence and public comment. Um, just for those who are here for the public hearings, we'll get, if you're here to comment on those, we'll get into those here in a minute. This is just a general public comment um, period. So individuals wishing to address the county court may do so at this time and at other times throughout the meeting. Speakers are asked to raise your hand to be recognized by the chair, give your name and address and limit comments to three minutes. And then I also just like to remind folks that um, we are very informal here. So as we move through the agenda, if there's something that you wanna interject, ask questions, provide comments as we move through the meeting, uh, we would welcome that. Um, for those who are dialing in or signing in via Zoom and you're, if you called in at star six to unmute yourself or um, the lower left-hand corner of the, the Zoom can also unmute yourself. So I would ask if there's any public comment at this point. Doesn't look to be. Okay, let's go into correspondence. We've got a couple of items in here. So um, the first one, and Joanna is actually on the line as well from Metro. Um, we received an email from the Solid Waste uh, Authorization Coordinator at Metro. And um, basically, um, Kim Waste has requested authorization to accept non-hazardous industrial waste and non-hazardous special waste um, that has been generated in the Metro region. And so Metro is considering that application at the moment and wanted to know if we had any concerns that we wanted to raise. So I said I would raise it here. And did I capture that, Joanna? 
Yes, essentially, you know, Chem Waste has applied to become a designated facility of a Metro solid waste system. And what that means is that, um, so Metro regulates all of the waste that is generated within the Metro region. So if it re leaves the region, it has to leave either under a non-system license, which is issued to the to the transporter of that waste, or it needs to go to a facility that's designated by Metro. So this, um, Chem Waste has applied to become a designated facility, um, which is a, an agreement that if, if Metro Council approves their application, uh, Metro would enter into an agreement with Chem Waste. And the point that I really wanna you know, make clear is that that doesn't guarantee any tonnage, doesn't guarantee that any waste flows to that facility. It just says for the materials that are um, in that designated facility, that uh, Chem Waste would be authorized to receive that material. So I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Um, and just one other point is that we have a designated facility agreement with Columbia Ridge Landfill. It's a similar arrangement. It just says that, um, you know, waste from the metro region can go to that facility and that in exchange, you know, they have to um, report fees and tax, report to us the tons that come from the metro region. They have to pay fees and taxes um, on that material. Um, and then they're required to operate, you know, uh, within the bounds of any federal, state, or local permits or requirements, you know, that are on the facility. Any concerns? Any questions? Has a conflict, I have a conflict. <laughs> Obvious conflict that's on the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and there she is. I, I don't have any questions for Metro, but I probably will have a conversation with Leah just to understand what, what the thinking is. Okay. And this is Leanne. I'm on today just in case you guys had any questions or any concerns. Um, this is just really preparation for the Portland Harbor waste for upcoming emerging contaminants, having that higher level of environmental protection to dispose of these waste streams. And if you guys have any questions or concerns, give me a call. Let me know. Okay. okay. Yeah, that kind of answers my question. So, yeah, thank yeah. you. Joanna, I don't think I have any concerns, and it doesn't sound like Commissioner Wilkins does either. So, excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. And also, under correspondence, we received our quarterly um, update on our veteran services. Um, uh, officer in all the great work that he is doing and so I every time when he submits this I am astounded at yeah. what he gets because I am reminded that this is only one county of the three that he serves and it's incredible so if you are a veteran or know of a veteran who could use his services um, please reach out to him. He's here in the courthouse one day a week, but um, accessible via phone and um, can help connect you with services and other things that you need. Uh, busy guy. Yes, he is, he is very busy. Busy guy. Very yeah. good hire, though. He's doing really great work. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, there's also an email um, that we received from uh, Steve Schaefer regarding the hiring of consultant Adam Hass for um, the fiber network RFP development. He had some questions about the, the money, where it was gonna come from and things like that. Um, so I wanted to put that on the record. That will also be part of the packet online. So if folks wanna read um, his comments. And then later in the meeting, we will also be taking up appointments to the compensation board and Les Ruark submitted two emails, um, one with some suggested names of the folks who have put in um, a letter of interest and um, sort of his favorites, I guess, among the group. And then also suggesting um, that we appoint a fourth appointee. And um, so again, all of these, I won't read them verbatim, but they are all available on the county's website under the court packet for folks who would like to see that. Um, okay, let's go into 4.0, which is public hearing number one, to receive public comment on ordinance number 2021-02, amendments to the Gallon County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, affecting articles four, section 4.020, exclusive farm use zone by adding guest ranch provisions. Other articles affected it include article one and article 11. And I have a nice little script that Michelle has prepared for me. So <laughs> 
Um, this is the time duly set and advertised for the public hearing to receive public comment on ordinance number 2021-02 text amendments to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, Article 4, Section 4.020, uh, exclusive farm use to add guest ranch provisions and related text amendments to articles one and 11. The hearing is now open. The public hearing will be conducted as follows. The staff will give the report and answer any questions from members of the county court. Following the staff report, I will then open the hearing for public testimony, proponent, neutral, and opponent. For the after the opportunity for public testimony, the county court may have additional questions for staff. The county court will then decide whether to close the hearing and deliberate the matter. I will now ask the commissioners to disclose any conflicts of interest or, or other matters that may preclude your participation in the proceedings. Please indicate the nature of the conflict and state whether you intend to participate in these proceedings. Does anybody have any conflicts of interest? I don't believe I do. I have no conflicts. Okay. Uh, neither do I. Does anybody wish to challenge the ability of any member of the county court to participate in these proceedings? And again, if you're coming in via Zoom, it's star six to unmute yourself and or in the bottom uh, left hand corner. Anybody want to challenge any of the court members? It's not looked. So, okay, we'll move on to rules. When you testify, please state your name and address for the record. Um, there's a sign-in sheet at the back of the room. Please keep your testimony concise and relevant to the issues before us this morning. All testimony shall be directed towards the county court and not to other members of the audience. Um, the applicable criteria are listed in the staff report. These are the criteria the county court will use to make uh, its decision. If you believe there are additional applicable approval criteria, please identify such criteria when providing your testimony. Fail to failure to raise an issue with sufficient specificity to afford the county court and all parties an opportunity to respond to an issue may preclude an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue and may preclude the ability to pursue an action for damages in circuit court. Additional rules and procedures for this hearing are as follows. The hearing is being recorded. Please be courteous and avoid repetitive or redundant testimony. The testimony should address the applicable approval criteria listed in the staff report. And to expedite the hearing, the members of the court may ask questions of persons as they testify. Staff will now present the staff report and any correspondence on this matter other than those items already included in the record. Michelle. Now I'm going to get a drink of water. <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. This, this is where I sit? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Good morning, judge and commissioners. Um, a little background for starters. The temporary provisions for guest ranches were originally introduced to the Oregon legislature in 1997, and the sunset date was extended repeatedly. In 2019, the legislator did make the guest ranch provisions permanent and added some additional requirements. The establishment of a guest ranch in exclusive farm use zone in Eastern Oregon is allowed provided it is in conjunction with an existing and continuing livestock operation and provided it meets certain conditions and criteria listed in the Oregon Revised Statutes. In 2001, Gillum County issued a permit to operate a guest ranch to Highland Hills Ranch, LLC. Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance was amended after 2001, and the guest ranch provision was removed, thereby making Highland Hills Ranch a non-conforming use in the exclusive farm use zone. There are limited, limited, uh, limitations on non-conforming uses, such as you cannot expand your use. Highland Hills Ranch submitted an application to amend the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance in accordance with the procedure set forth in Article 10 of the Zoning and Land Development Ordinance. I will provide a summary of the staff report as it is entered officially into the record and the members of the court received a copy in advance of the hearing. The staff report demonstrates the request to add guest ranch provisions to the exclusive farm use zone meeting Gillum County Comprehensive Plan Standards and Oregon Statewide Planning Goals and Oregon Revised Statutes Criteria under ORS 215.283 and ORS 215.461 and 462. 
Notice of the text amendments was provided to the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development and notice of plan of the Planning Commission public hearing and county court hearing was done in accordance with statutory notice requirements. March 30th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on the matter and is recommending to the county court to move forward with formal adoption of the text amendments to the Gillen County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, affecting Articles 1, 4, and 11. The Planning Commission's recommendation is to adopt text amend amendments as presented by staff. The proposed text amendments to Article 1 and 11 were a matter of correcting or clarifying language that came about after looking at the additions to Article 4, the text amendments to Article 4, specific to exclusive farm use zone, land 4.020, is introducing new language to allow as a conditional use guest ranches. The text language came straight from ORS. It is verbatim. I'm going to just hit a few points. So under section of the Gillen County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, so if you're following along, this should be under page three of article four that was presented in um, the staff report under this section. It says D, conditional use is permitted. And then um, there's a whole bunch of stars because there's a lot of, ish, um, a lot of matters or uses. And so this would be a new number 23, guest ranches subject to 4.02, zero H and the following standards. It provides definitions for guest ranch, including guest lodging unit, means a guest room in a lodge, bunkhouse, cottage, or cabin used only for transient overnight lodging and not for permanent residence. Another definition, guest ranch, means a facility for guest lodging units, passive recreational activities described in subsection F and food services described in subsection G that are incidental and accessory to an existing continuing livestock oper operation. And then it defines what livestock is under this. And livestock means cattle, sheep, horse, and bison. <clears throat> and then there's, um, according to ORS, which we inserted directly verbatim into the code, there's um, certain limitations on where guest ranch can be. And so that goes into subsection B and C. And there's limitations on how much land you have to have. You have to have a minimum of at least 160 acres. And then it also includes specifics on square footage and occupants. So beyond the first 160, acre, 160 acres, there are certain requirements of square footage and how many occupants you can, you can have based on additional um, acreage. So that takes us clear down to H um, of this section. And H says that you can't have a guest ranch in conjunction with a campground or a golf course. So there are limitations in addition to just the sizing of the acreage. And then um, the governing body of the county or its designee may approve, may not approve a proposed division of a land for guest ranch or guest ranch dwelling of an individual. So that's I, where it's listed some more criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we, um, from 4.02, 020, there's H, so it said subject to that. So we cleaned up some of the language under H and made it um, in more compliance with the language that you see in RS. So we used verbatim there. Then we move to, as I mentioned, Article 11. And going through Article 4, it referenced certain um, activities in Article 11. So those are administrative provisions and other activities that um, noticing requirements that the language just needed to be cleaned up and clarified to accurately reflect what was in ORS. So that's where we get article um, changes to article 11. And then I would just like to mention um, this, for anyone that can, well, anyone in the exclusive farm use zone that meets the specific standards that we've outlined according to RS that we've inserted into the code can make an application and can apply, provided they make all those standards and can meet everything. Um, so this is blanket across the exclusive farm use land in Gillen County. Um, staff concurs with the planning commission recommendation that the recommendation of the county court consider adoption of the county ordinance number two. 
2021-02, adopting land use file number L2021-02, text of amendments to the Gilman County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, affecting Articles 1, 4, and 11, to add guest grants, provisions, and related text amendments to the Gilman County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, based on findings of facts and conclusions of law contained in the staff report as presented. There was no um, adverse testimony or comments received at the planning commission. So the planning commission is, the staff report was just amended slightly for some um, public noticing to the county court. So it's pretty much as what was presented to the planning commission. We didn't make any alterations. Um, so it's based on everything that was presented to the planning commission, no amendments. We're coming to the county court, um, proposing that the county court adopt this via ordinance. At this time, I would ask, are there any questions of the county court members regarding this proposal? Questions for Michelle? Oh. I don't have any. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any. Me either. So let's go ahead and move into public testimony. At this time, we'll receive public testimony. Proponents of the application shall speak first. Opponents of the application shall speak second. And neutral testimony shall proceed third and any agency comments next. And again, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. For folks who are dialing in, um, it's star six to unmute yourself. So I'll go through each of those um, groups to give people plenty of time to unmute. Um, and so we'll start with uh, the proponents. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the application? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. I can't figure it out. <laughs> if you could just for your, the record state your name and um, address. That would be uh, Dennis McNabb. Uh, address, my permanent address, 1321 East 18th, the Dallas Oregon. Uh, all we want to do is add four cabins to go to single, more single occupancy. Uh, when we built, it was double occupancy. It was kind of the standard in the industry. Now it's shifted to single occupancy. So basically four cabins with a bed, two bedrooms in each cabin. So eight more bedrooms to you know, have people have single occupancy. Mm -hmm. So that's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> questions? I don't have any questions. No. Any other questions? Uh, Folks who want to speak in um, in favor of the application. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? I do not see anybody. We'll give folks just a second, but it looks like it's all Gillen County people who are on Gillen County staff, aside from Catherine. Kelly. And, and Kelly. Um, anybody who wishes to provide neutral testimony? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone representing an agency who wishes to speak? Again, it's star six to unmute yourself. Okay, does staff have anything to add in response to the testimony? No, um, if there's no questions, um, staff just concurs with the planning commission for recommendation. Thank you. Okay. You can see this that. has been very difficult. <laughs> the last one was like this. Does I get all nervous, you know, that somebody's going to ask too many questions. <laughs> Nobody asked. Does any member of the court have any further questions of staff? I do not. Okay. Um, so at this point, we have two options. Uh, the county court uh, may, if additional oral testimony is necessary, continue the hearing to a date and time certain. Um, if continued to the date certain, the record would remain open until the date of the continued hearing for the submission of written uh, testimony, or we can move forward with closing the hearing and proceed to deliberations. How do you guys want to proceed? Want me to close it? Yes. Okay. Um, so there are no further questions. And so I will go ahead and close the public hearing and we'll move into discussion. Um,
Any further discussion? No. Okay, do I have a motion? I move to approve the amendments to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance as proposed under land use file number L2021-02 based on findings of fact and conclusions of law contained in the staff report. I second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the amendments to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance as proposed under land use file number L2021-02 based on findings of fact and conclusions of law contained in the staff report. Is there further, question, or further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so now to adopt the ordinance, this is the first, uh, this is a two-step process so the audience understands. Uh, ordinances have to be read twice before they can be adopted. And so if the court wishes to proceed, we would do the first reading today and then during the next regular meeting, proceed with the second reading and adoption. I move to have the first reading of ordinance number 2021-02 by title only. I'll second again. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded that we have the first reading of ordinance number 2021-02 by title only. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. In the, county, in the county court of the state of Oregon in and for the county of Gillum, ordinance number 2021-02, in the matter of an ordinance providing for amendments to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, affecting Article 4, Section 4.020, Exclusive Farm Use Zone, by adding guest ranch provisions, other articles affected include Article 1 and 11. I move to accept the first reading of ordinance number 2021-02 by title only. I second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded that we accept the first reading of ordinance number 2021-02 by title only. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. So during our next meeting, we will take up the second reading and adoption, and then it will it will be so. <laughs> okay, thank, you. thank you for coming. With that said, we're gone on the next, it's May 5th, correct? Yep. Uh, so yep. that's not a problem. It's, it's mostly at this point a procedural. Yeah. So the hearing itself has been closed. So we'll, we'll just take it up during our regular agenda and, and move forward, I think. So okay. thank well, you thank for you coming. <laughs> thank you. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah. it is. Come down and... Uh, season. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. Don't bring the tax assessor. Would <laughs> <laughs> be uh, needed the tax <laughs> assessor. <laughs> okay, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we will move into 5.0, which is public hearing number 2 to receive public comment on the on ordinance number 2021-03. Adopting Gillum County Comprehensive Plan Zoning Map Amendment and a proposed text amendment to add a new zone to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, Article 4, Section 4.130, um, Rural Residential 2 Zone. Again, here uh, I've got a lengthy script I need to read to make it official. So this is the time duly set and advertised for a public hearing to consider public comment on draft ordinance number 2021-03, adopting Gillum County Comprehensive Plan Zoning Map Amendment and a proposed text amendment to add a new zone to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance. Article 4, Section 4.130, Rural Residential 2 Zone. The hearing is now open. The public hearing will be conducted as follows. Staff will give the report and answer any questions from members of the county court. Following the staff report, I will then open the hearing for public testimony, proponent, neutral, and opponent. After the opportunity for public testimony, the county court will have additional, may have additional questions for staff. The county court will then decide whether to close the hearing and deliberate the matter. I will now ask the commissioners to disclose any conflicts of interest or other matters that might preclude your participation in these proceedings. Please indicate the nature of the conflict and state whether you intend to participate in these proceedings. Any conflicts of interest on this one? I do not. I do not either. Okay. Does anybody wish to challenge the ability of any of the county court to participate in these proceedings? 
Again, it's star six to unmute yourself. Is there anybody in the courtroom? Okay. Um, then we will move on to the rules um, on testimony. When you testify, please state your name and address for the record. Please keep your testimony concise and relevant to the issues before us this morning. All testimony shall be directed towards the county court and not to other members of the audience. The applicable criteria are listed in the staff report. These are the criteria the county court will make to you, will use to make its decision. If you believe there are additional applicable approval criteria, please identify such criteria when providing your testimony. Failure to raise an issue with sufficient specificity to afford the county court and all parties an opportunity to respond to an issue may preclude an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue and may preclude the ability to pursue an action for damages in circuit court. Additional rules and procedures for this hearing are as follows. The hearing is being recorded. Please be courteous and avoid repetitive or redundant testimony. Testimony shall, should address the applicable approval criteria listed in the staff report. To expedite the hearing, the members of the court may ask questions of persons as they testify. Staff will now present the staff report and any correspondence on this matter other than those items already included in the record. Kirk, are you, you're yes. up. Sorry, sorry. Let's see. Let's see. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kirk Fatlin. I've been working with Mrs. Colby on this um, this project. This is part of part one of two um, effort to clean up a couple sort of inaccurate zonings outside of the city of Condon. This one lies within the urban growth boundary, but outside of city limits. Um, and I'll pass you a map here in a second. We just got those done. Uh, but the idea here is to allow for larger lot residentials in the keeping of horses. That's what goes on in this area. Anyways, it's between the highway north of Cottonwood, between the highway to the east and then Brown Lane to the west. So the idea is to allow for what is there um, while also <laughs> making them more conforming. So there's non-conforming uses there, such as house, the house um, that we've been working with Mr. Halderson to make something that works. So tonight we'll be, or I guess this morning, we'll be looking at um, a map amendment to the comprehensive plan to designate the area it is currently industrial, to designate it residential, rural residential. And then we've also prepared a draft ordinance, um, a rural residential two zone that would apply to it. So since this is within the urban growth boundary, um, it's been brought before the city planning commission, the city council and the county planning commission. Um, at the County Planning Commission, there were some amendments to the, we went through the rural residential zone and looked at what some options would be to, uh, to tighten that up and allow for uh, what is already there and plan for the future. So it's kind of a, this is a complex area with multiple things going on. As you know, there are some industrial type uses um, with Mr. Alderson's warehouse there. And then there is also homes and agriculture uses. So trying to find something that works for everyone uh, and makes sense for, for future growth has kind of been a balancing act. I feel like we, we've gotten to a good place on it and the planning commission did as well. So it was recommended for approval by the city and then also the planning commission with those amendments. I will pass these out to you if that works for you folks. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one here, I'll pass you, they're essentially the same maps. The first one shows the comprehensive plan amendment. So this is saying, okay, if he doesn't need it, rural residential. And then the next one shows that it will be rural residential too. And if that doesn't make sense, definitely ask me. So the, the red line at the top is the urban growth boundary. So that's, it's a majority of two of the larger parcels and then the entirety of, um, I think six or seven other parcels. Questions for Kirk so far. I 
And yeah, and again, the main purpose is to allow for, for what is there. Um, yeah. If you folks have the actual zone in front of you, um, we can also look at that, but I think the planning commission did a really good job of working through that point by point, um, trying to show that this will this will allow for what what people would actually want to use that land for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's being used for. What and specifically what's being used for exactly. And for the record, so folks know that the Kirk staff report is part of the record for this. So, right. and the commissioners received it um, last week, so right. they've had time to to read through it, which is why we're yes. not going point by point through exactly. all of yeah. the findings. Yes. Yeah. We've, we've been given lots of information. Um, okay, so any additional questions for Kirk? If not, I think we can move into public testimony. Um, so at this time, we'll, we will receive public testimony. Proponents of the application shall speak first. Opponents of the application shall speak second. And neutral testimony shall proceed third. And then any agency comments next. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the application? If you could come on up. Um, and please, you can, yeah, yeah Kirk can sit in the front row if he wants. <laughs> And then if you can just come up and state your name and address for the record. Sure. My name's Lane Halverson. I'm from Fondland, Oregon. Within the urban growth map. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably point on this map right. to where you are. <laughs> I have several properties within that, and I have several uses. Uh, horse pasture, a residential home, and then I have an industrial uh, tank farm. So, and warehouse. So it's kind of complicated, like Kirk said, there's a lot of things going on there. And I want to thank everybody for being accommodating. It's, it could have been more difficult, difficult, but it hasn't been. Um, now, if I'm correct, the only stipulation that can't happen there is commercial? Essentially, property. yeah, essentially. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I can keep the current tank farm property, the old Fatland property, as industrial use, I won't be out of business. And uh, that would be very nice. <laughs> and my house as a whole, I would like to live there. And uh, two horse pastures. If all that works, I'm happy. Okay. That appears to work, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and as we've discussed, you'd be able to expand on that the warehouse property, but you know, just on that, just on that property. Okay. <laughs> we've had several phone calls. It's a little complicated, but that's that's working out fine. Uh, if all those criteria, if I can still do all of those things, I'm I'm happy. Okay. Questions? I don't think so. All right. Thank you for testifying. Thank you. And um, any others who wish to speak in favor of the application? You're calling in via Zoom. It's star six to unmute yourself for the lower left-hand side of the Zoom platform. I'll get people just a second. Doesn't look like we have anybody. Anybody who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? Okay, anybody who wishes to provide neutral testimony? Looks just a second, do not see anybody. Anybody representing an agency who wishes to speak? I don't see anybody. Um, Kirk, do you have any, anything to add in response to the testimony? No, thanks for being so helpful. The company also has been excellent to work with you and come to the solution. Uh, any member of the court have any further questions of staff? I do not. I do not either. I've been thoroughly um, researched. And it, I think it's wonderful that we're able to get this kind of cleaned up. Right, yes. Because um, yeah. there were some existing uses anyway. And so the fact that you guys came up with a solution that will... Yeah allow people to continue doing what they've been doing and make it compliant with the law, I think is a good thing. So um, 
So again, we have the option of leaving the hearing open or closing it. Yes, let's do. Okay. Um, so if there are no further questions, I will now close the public hearing and we will move into deliberations. Further discussion by the commissioners? Are we ready for a motion? Not for me. I have nothing further. Okay. Do we have a motion? Okay. It's your turn. <laughs> I move to approve the amendments to the Gillen County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance as proposed under land use file number L-2021-01 based on findings of fact and conclusions of law contained in the staff report. And I will second. it. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the amendments to the Gillen County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance as proposed under land use file number L-2021-01 based on findings of fact and conclusions of law contained in the staff report. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Again, this is uh, adopted via ordinance, and so this is a two-step process. Um, if the court wishes to proceed, we would do the first reading today. The second reading would be held during our next uh, regular meeting, second reading and adoption um, on May 5th. Is there a motion on the first reading? I move that the first reading of the ordinance number 2021-03 by title only. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we have the first reading of ordinance number 2021-03 by title only. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. In the County Court of the State of Oregon in and for the County of Gillum, ordinance number 2021-03, in the matter of an ordinance providing for amendments to the Gillum County Zoning and Land Development Ordinance, affecting Article 4, section, adding section 4.1030, uh, RR2, Rural Residential 2 Zone, an amendment to comprehensive plan zoning map to apply Rural Residential 2 to portion of City of Condon Urban Growth Boundary, that section north of Cottonwood Lane and bordered by Highway 19 on the east and bordered by Brown Lane to the west. I move to accept the first reading of ordinance number 2021-03 by title only. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept the first reading of ordinance number 2021-03 by title only. Is there further discussion? No. No, ma'am. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. We will do the second reading and adoption during the May 5th um, meeting. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good work, staff. Thank you. These yes. are heavy lifts, I know. And good, lots of time and energy involved. Good staff report. So this, if I remember right, there's a second portion of that, and that's still working its way through planning? Yes. Okay. So the Dunn's edition, which is on the, the west side of, right. of Brown Lane, right. like exactly that old subdivision. Um, so it's very similar. Yeah. Got um, it. But yeah, the planning commission had additional questions, mm -hmm. so we're answering those right. next week. And yeah, should yeah. be two folks after that, hopefully. Wonderful. I think we're on the right track. It just I more know. options to consider. So we're doing that. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. All, all right. right. Great. Thank Thanks, Kirk. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> You would die if I told you. <laughs> okay, let's move into 6.0, the consent agenda. Any questions on it? Consent agenda questions, Mr. Shannon. I do not have any. I move we accept the consent agenda. Approve it. I second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda, which consists of Consider approval of April 7th, 2021 regular meeting minutes. Consider approval of April 7th, 2021 executive session minutes. Consider approval of April yes. bills pending review. Consider approval of revised intergovernmental agreement number 90G000360 with the City of Boardman and State of Oregon for building code services. And consider appointment of Lori Anderson to the North Central Public Health District Budget Committee, effective April 21st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. Is there further discussion? 
And you guys noted on the IGA there was just some technical fixes that the city caught after the after the fact. Um, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, let me move into. Let's see, Pat, do you want to text um, Shelley? Um. We could, if you wanted to, we could go into the compensation committee appointments. Should we take a quick break? Uh, yeah, we could do that. Why don't we take a, should we take a 10 minute break? Okay. And that'll give Shelly time to log in and we can start up with North Central Public Health. Um, and let's go into, we had added uh, North Central Public Health District Vaccination Promotion. And I see Shelly's on. Pat, do you want to kick us off or do you want Shelly to do it? No, I just, I've been in contact with Shelly a little bit, trying to set something up. With, um, the uh, health district recommended that we have some conversation about trying to figure out if there's a way we could promote a little better um, vaccination percentage in Gillum County, because as one of the attachments shows in our age group of 65 plus, we're 35 out of 36 counties. So well, that's why we're here. Right, Shelly? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. I see that um, Dr. McDonald is also on the call. So um, just wanted to touch base with you guys on as new information comes out on the number of um, Gillum County residents that are vaccinated and what we're doing as far as um, working with you to get all your community vaccinated and answer your questions and then tell you about some plans that we have on doing outreach into the community and how we can ask for your help and work together and getting um, as many people vaccinated and answering those questions around vaccine hesitancy. So just to give you some numbers to begin with, if it's okay, um, currently um, for Gillen County, there's 558 people vaccinated out of those 443 are fully vaccinated. So have either, uh, if it's Johnson & Johnson received the one dose but, uh, or the two doses um, and 115 in progress. So right now we have 28% of all your residents that are vaccinated and Oregon currently is at 38%, Wasco is at 36% and Sherman's at 34. So we do know some data came out and um, Gillum County was a little lower in the rankings of that. So of course we wanted to make sure that we were working with you to um, address that and see how we could um, work together to get more people vaccinated. And we do have clinics that are, our mobile clinics that are going out. Um, I believe this Friday, we have another clinic going out to provide vaccine. Um, we've been certainly working closely with your emergency manager, Chris, to make that happen and the Condon Clinic, as well as the Arlington Clinic. I think now one of the questions um, I'd like to pose to you guys is what else do you feel you need or how can we work together to get more information out there and address some of the concerns? We, are, we have been and are putting information in the water bills, electric bills, um, PSAs. We're trying to be creative on any way we can help um, get the information out there that vaccine is available and we will come to you and or certainly the residents are welcome to come to and invited to come to the readiness center and um, have their vaccines um, most week. We have clinics there Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday all day. So I will open it up really to questions um, or to Dr. McDonald if she'd like to add anything to that. I had a question on the data. When, when they're giving, when OHA is doing the percentage of population is that the percentage of 16 plus, or is that the total, including the, the kids who are obviously not eligible for that? I, I've never been quite clear on what that data is actually showing. Is that of the eligible people, or is that of the entire population? That so, um, I can answer that question, and the answer is yes and yes. It's both, and it depends on which data set you're looking at. So that average of 28%, that's of all individuals. And then the other data points that had to do with the um, kind of specific, pardon me, specific age groups. So if it's 65 
and up that percentage of those who've been vaccinated is just the 65 and uppers and of the 16 and up it's you know percentage of 16 and uppers so two different data sets a little confusing but that's the way that those ones are the ones that are broken down by age um, are a little more specific chris did you yeah. have something yeah, I'm, I'm sure this is correct but even if they went to wheeler county and got vaccinated or went to wasco county that still is all tracked in the system right that is correct they the state i will say did have a little bit of um for about a week and a half, they weren't posting county rates because of some of it was had to do with how they were doing it by zip codes, but then people in the same zip code lived in different counties, but they got that sorted. So it's um, tracked not by where you got it, but by where you reside. And then um, I guess it's just, we've, we've got a lot of resistance in Gillum County to get the vaccine. I don't know if that's happening in Washington or Sherman or not. But, uh, and the, and the Pfizer hiccup didn't help. I mean, the J&J hiccup didn't help. Yeah, we are seeing our numbers um, of everyone and our clinics go down a little bit. Um, and we think part of that um, is, one, that there is some vaccine hesitancy, certainly around the J&J, where we were concerned with that. We're um, looking forward to that being resolved and the J&J being available again. Some people just wanted the J&J &J because it was one, one um, vaccine. So as that unfolds and we get more information around that, we'll be providing that as well when we get it. We do have some um, Pfizer vaccine that is focused for um, 16 and 17 year olds and their family. We are having a clinic this Friday night here called Friday Night Lights um, on the football field. And we're gonna have pizza and some prizes and it's really focused to get our youth signed up, the 16 and 17 year olds. And that certainly is open to um, 16 and 17 year olds in Gillum and Sherman County. We will have, and we do have um, some put aside to be working to come out there and provide that to your 16 and 17 year olds as well. Is that a sign up or show up? I suppose you sign up, huh? It's both really. Um, we encourage people to sign up on our website for that but we do have some doses set aside um, and specifically for Friday night for walk-ins. Chris, do you have anything you wanna add? So, hi Mimi and Shelly, this is Chris. <laughs> we finally get to see you. <laughs> Uh, dang it, anyhow. Um, so I have 27. Um, so I had 30 people signed up for J&J &J for Friday. And after I made phone calls yesterday to let them know it wasn't going to be J&J, &J, I actually have su pleasantly surprised that 27 still want it. So I have 27 new people um, along with the other 30, um, the 30 for second doses and 27 for new first doses um, on Friday. So with that being said, um, I will be honest with you. I, <laughs> my phone is not ringing off the hook. David Anderson's phone is not ringing off the hook and neither is the South Gillen Health Center phone. None of us, our phones are ringing off the hook. And I had a conversation with Anna Terrapata yesterday at Murray's as well. And they've got vaccines running out their wazoo now. Um, because, um, and you know, again, the federal government didn't do us any favors when they made these vials, 10, 10 doses to a vial. But um, they are finding out now that with a, a bunch of the people that they have done from the Valley that came up and got their first doses, they're not coming back and getting their seconds because um, the vaccines are open and there's a surge in the, in the metro area of some of those people that had gotten done up here at Murray's. Um, they have forwarded some of their vaccines over to Hepner because the Hepner Murray's did not receive any. Um, so I, you know, Murray's is like saying, you know, they're like, we don't know what to do either. We're, we're stuck here with all these vaccines and we don't have people that are, you know, knocking down our doors to come get them as well. So with that being said, I, the, a couple of uh, issues I have, and I went through that worksheet um, really well this morning again, um, looking at it and again, so we haven't, <laughs> we haven't offered the, Pfizer vaccine to our 16 and 17 year olds, which according to the worksheet, there's only 58 of them in Gillum County anyhow. Um, and according to, it's a 16 through 19 and four of them have been, at, been done. And I can tell you, I, I can remember who the four 18 year olds are um, already. Um, 
So um, I'm not sure what kind of, and I don't have parents not, you know, ringing down my, um, my phone asking for their 16 and 17 year olds to be vaccinated as well. Um, I am just going to tell you right now, I just think that we're in a county that's um, not really, I don't want to say pro vaccine or whatever, but, you know, I don't know what to tell. I don't know what else to do. We've done the papers. We've done the county newsletter. We've done, uh, Sabrina has taken the flyers to the senior meal sites and to the senior citizens called and offered the, the senior transportation bus to take people to the to the site in our, in the Dallas and only got one bus to do that at the beginning. She barely got five people to go then. Um, I just, I, I, I don't know. And the one thing that I have a concern about, and I, I tried reaching out to OHA today, um, is in the alert system, as far as I know that they were doing the, the percentages by zip code. Is that correct? Okay. The problem I have is, there are people who have zip codes that belong in Fossil, but they live in Gillum County. There are people who have zip codes that belong in, that go to Ione. They live in Gillum County. So right. I, I, I'm sorry, Chris. I'm just going to hop in because I know that was that was part of the issue. And that's kind of why they do it by zip code. But then they also do it by something called geo code. So I really think they tried to rectify that and to make sure. And that was what that was the big issue that people were getting put in the wrong county. Um, so I really believe that's been rectified, that they've been able to hone in and make sure that um, people are assigned to the correct county. And and I think what you're I mean, I one I. I don't know if everyone knows how much work Chris has done for this, but it's been unbelievable and she's been tireless. So I am, we are all so grateful. And I think it, what is happening is, is happening everywhere to a letter more or less degree. And I think the issue is we got everyone who wants it. And now it's going to be about conversations that people have with people that they trust. And be that their, their primary care provider, be that someone in their neighborhood, whatever it is and it will it's you know it's just going to be different and my hope is that we can have the focus on you know beating covid um and having people and and not um you know kind of there should not be any negativity about um what pe where people are at and just meeting them where they are and say okay yep i want to hear about it um, please tell me what's going on, um, reasons why you might be hesitant, and then just listen and just say, okay, well, all right, thank you for that information. And then when people are ready for feed feedback or additional information, give them that. But I think it's it it is going to take um, it's just going to take a lot more time and trust, and that can't be rushed. And so that's why we're really reaching out to all of you who live there. And like I said, Chris has worked tirelessly, but to um, you know reach out to your own primary care providers or encourage people to do so, people that they trust. Um, so it doesn't become, um, nobody likes to be told what to do. And people in Gillum County really don't like to be told what to do. Uh, so to Marla's degree. So it really has to be people choosing to be vaccinated and, and it has to meet with their core beliefs. And I, my hope is that people will understand part of it is being able to keep our children safe, keep more vulnerable people safe, all those other th other reasons, and that it's not that someone is being forced to do anything, but hopefully we can get people to where they feel safe, confident, and want to make a choice um, that being vaccinated, which really is our best tool that we have right now to end this pandemic, is the way to go. So, so Mimi, the, the thing that I hear from most people is that there's no motivation tool. There's, there's nothing there. Um, you know, they, they want to be told if they get vaccinated that they don't have to wear masks anymore. Or, you know, there's nothing. That's the most thing that I've heard, I hear from people is that there's no motivation to, yeah. you know, because they're hearing everything from the government, from the governor or whatever, stating and or OSHA, who's pushing that we potentially were going to have a mask mandate forever, you know, type of thing. And so there, these people, uh, I mean, because I talk to people all the time at lunch, especially downtown, and um, they have come to me forever with people, you know, wanting to know when it was coming and stuff like that at the beginning. But now I have the people saying, well, why should I get it? There's, there's no motivation that, you know, it's just going to be, you know, whatever. There's nothing, nothing's going to change. Yeah. And so I, I definitely hear that. And it is super frustrating. And sometimes it takes, it has to be 
a little bit of a thought beyond that next step is that yes, when we have a sufficient number of people who have either been vaccinated or, or have natural immunity, we do get to stop wearing masks. There is an end, but unless we all work together, it's not going to get there. It's just kind of one of those things where people have to, and again, super awesome 16 and up can get it. You know, think of all those kids in schools who cannot be vaccinated. Um, and so it is a way to protect them. We know it's rare that kids get really sick, but it's not, but it is a reality. And so kind of maybe encouraging people to go beyond that first step of like, because I'm with you. I really don't like wearing masks. It frustrates the heck out of me. And to know that it will end, um, it's not quite as um, easy or as simple as you get a vaccine. I mean, certainly there are some situations where you no longer have to wear masks, which is awesome, um, but it's still gonna take more time. But unless everyone does it, it will take even longer. So to me, it's a little bit of a, a challenging thought process like, if, well, I'm not going to do it because it won't change anything. And the fact is, it actually will change things. It just takes, it's a little bit longer than immediate. So kind of that longer term help and, and thinking of helping more the community as a whole, then I know people are really uh, used to, you know, thinking of individual and we really, really need to think of our communities. Yeah, well, it's kind of hard. I know that one of the things you hear from people that have gotten the vaccine that still have to wear a mask say, we're being punished to keep those that won't get a vaccine vaccinated. <laughs> you know, it's, it, yeah. we have to wear a mask because they don't get a vaccination. Well, um, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not really punishment. It's, you know, it's our efforts to keep people safe, but it is hard. It's true when there are those who are participating as part of the community and not, and not, you know, there are some people who, you know, medical reasons why they can't do it, other things, but, Again, when not everyone in the community is participating, it does make it really hard. Hopefully there can be some positive peer pressure, again, from people that live out there and people that you know, trust others as to why there are some, again, reasons that speak to your values. This is important, I care about the kids. I care about the kids being able to stay in school um, and not have to, if one person gets COVID then the whole you know, cohort has to stay home for two weeks, whatever, you know, to really lower our rates. And we've had so, some of that even in the workplace. We had a resident that was in some of the businesses the other day, and the rumor was he had COVID and was, it doesn't take long to get around town. And we've had employees that were concerned because they came into one of my businesses. And, and I've been, you know, suggesting to them it'd be a good idea to get the vaccination and, and uh, you know, calling a panic on the phone. So and so was in here and they say he's got COVID, you know, and it's, well, Maybe you should have got the vaccine, you know, and just kind of push that message. And same thing happened at Waste Management with my wife this last week. An uh, uh, employee there tested positive, uh, tested positive, apparently, and is sick. And so there's a bunch of employees in the office area there that, well, we need to go home and quarantine or whatever. What are you going to do, Leanne? She said, I'm not doing anything. I've been vaccinated. So, you, you know, kind of pushing that message is what, and I've been doing every place to go, if nothing else, I just, have you been vaccinated and ask them and, and kind of get into the conversation and tell them that I have. And if nothing else, I feel safer because I got vaccinated and I didn't, I wasn't planning on getting it. So, so Mimi, um, a couple things. Um, is there a way to, um, for you guys to reach out to Michelle and Brandon at the, at the school level? Oh yeah. Yeah, I talk with then, them every Monday. Okay, perfect. So then you can potentially have them send something out to the parents of the 16 and 17 year olds. Yep. How many may be um, interested in the Pfizer? Because I think that's going to be our best avenue is go that direction through the schools. Um, and then the other thing too, is like Pat said, um, what I'm finding out is um, I've literally had people have gotten the first shot and they were so sick after the first one, they elected to not come back for the second one and or people have gotten deathly ill from the second one. And that's what everybody hears is how sick everybody's gotten from the second one. And I, knock on wood, was one of the lucky ones that did not have any symptoms from the first one or the second one. So I try and, and, and give that information to people as much as I can that, hey, you know, I, I didn't have any um, of the sickness after the second one either. So, you know, or there's things that you can do to potentially 
curb that sickness after the second one. So there are those people that are hearing the horror stories from other people and are electing not to get it because of that. And some people say, oh, I'd just rather get it and, and deal with it than get the vaccine. And so again, it's these, it's it, like I said, it's a word of mouth from our locals and um, people are just electing not to do it. Do you so. think it, because our county hasn't actually seen how horrific the well, disease the, is because right, we're positive. we're out here and, and nobody that we're really close to has actually gotten deathly ill from the disease. And so yes. people are a little, you know, Hesitant. you know, whatever if people are dying somewhere, but they're not dying here. Exactly. And and I wonder if this recent death in Sherman County might wake some people up a little bit and let well, them know that even, it could be even in Sherman County. Or yeah. It could happen, you know, we don't know when it's going to happen, when someone really gets affected, you know, it could be you, you don't know. Well, that's how I feel. I mean, both my kids have had it, all my grandkids, and we fed people from coast to coast since March of last year, and have had no issues anywhere with anything, and it, you're just not as nervous right. about it when you're living in that environment. Right. Mimi, I wonder if maybe, because we will have people who look back and watch the YouTube recording of this. I wonder to Pat's point about folks who feel like I got this shot and now nothing has changed for me other than my own personal, um, you know, comfort that I'm probably not going to get sick and die from COVID. What is the science, what does the science tell us about why if you're vaccinated, you can't take off the mask? Is it this idea that you still could potentially contract it and spread it or what's behind that? Right, no, su such a good point. So there's a, a couple of things. There is some really good data coming out that those who are vaccinated do not spread the disease. So as, as we get more, I think as there is more confidence in that data, um, which it, at first we really didn't know that, that, you know, like, well, maybe people won't get sick, but they will spread it. So it's looking really good that we won't be able to spread it the other issue, and this one is even more, gosh, it's so hard to like wrap our heads around this. The other issue is there are variants, you know, you guys have probably heard about a little bit, you know, kind of mutes, mutant <laughs> COVID-19 viruses that um, are some of, some are um, able to kind of sneak by the vaccine. And we do know the vaccine's not a hundred percent. So while sort of in the community at large, there's still, so much floating around um, that's like writ large, like meaning world or in the United States, that's kind of why, because, you know, vaccine's not hundred percent. There are variants that the vaccine may not hit. Really though, I think that, um, you know, especially in people's, you know, um, as we talked about, you know, people can have gatherings if, you know, with another family or whatnot, if people are vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks anymore, which is fantastic. So there is some level of security and I, my thought is that will continue to grow and that there'll be more guidance like, okay, if everyone in the workplace is vaccinated, people don't have to wear a mask anymore. I'm not saying that right this minute, but it does. And that needs to come because I agree. I mean, I think that we do need that science and we need that um, kind of, that kind of guidance um, to, as you said, Chris, motivate people to want to get vaccinated. But, and I, I definitely sympathize with um, people feeling like it's not happening here because that's the way, that, I mean, you know, that's how we operate. We don't operate in the theoretical world. We operate in the day-to-day -day world. So I definitely understand the challenge people have. Um, and I think that um, that's why it, it, it definitely takes a little bit more effort to really kind of, you know, have all, it sounds like you guys are all having amazing conversations with people and letting them know reasons why you think that it's useful. I think the workplace one is great. If you're vaccinated, if you're fully vaccinated and you get exposed to someone, you don't have to miss work time um, or school time or whatever, you know, as the more and more kids get vaccinated, it just doesn't affect you as much. So there are immediate things that are better. Um, but that's kind of why the mask thing, there is, there is science behind it. It's not a hunt, it's not some sort of, as someone said, a punishment. It's not a punishment. We're just really trying to keep people safe. Got it. Any, uh, Catherine, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I, you know, one thing that I have is I think, so I have a, a sister that got COVID 
And she thinks now that she doesn't need to get the shot because she's totally immune from everything. So when I, when I think of this, I, I would appreciate, and she doesn't live in the county. She lives in Wyoming, but she's coming to visit our mother here. And I would like to get some education to give to her to say, hey, this is what the health department's actually saying. And it would really help us since you're going to get on an airplane to get vaccinated. And I think a lot of the people in the community that have caught COVID and maybe not had very strong reactions to it also need to know that they need to be vaccinated because there's variants and because you're going to protect the rest of us that just because you had COVID doesn't mean that you're totally immune to what's coming down the pike. So I think education is the key. And if there's more education you can give to us about that, I would really appreciate it to sure. give to it. We Plus can... I have two boys that are in their twenties that are thinking they're, they're bulletproof and I need to get it through to them that they need to get vaccinated. <laughs> so. Yeah, we can certainly send um, some to the court and, and I will say, you know, just the, basic CDC website, <laughs> Google CDC, do I need to be vaccinated if I've had COVID and a whole bunch of info will pop up, but um, we're happy to send some more. And yes, um, it is very hard to convince a 22 year old male that they are not invincible. Um, so <laughs> that's why they ride motorcycles too. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but again, maybe appealing to their sense of others like your mother or other people that they love and care for, even if they're not willing to do it for themselves to think about others. Yeah, thanks. Some people just don't care. I had somebody say the other day, I'm not wearing a mask, and if you're worried about it, put two on. <laughs> one for you and one for me. I'm not wearing it. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else that we want to add to this? I think the call out for people, the public who is watching this is, is please, if you have been vaccinated and you have somebody in your family who is resisting it, maybe talk to them about your experience and why it's important for the whole community to reach that sort of herd immunity that we keep talking about so we can get back to normal. Um, I don't know what to say to them. I, I, I've said it. <laughs> what to tell you. I don't I'm know where they're coming the from. I'm conversation with almost everybody I run into. Uh, <laughs> Pat's going to single-handedly get those grades up. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you guys for joining us today. Well, thank you. And please let us know however we can help. Um, you can even just have people call us directly um, if they're hesitant and need questions answered. We're, we're more than happy to, to have that message. Sounds good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. On Bye, Friday. Guys. Take care. Okay. Get your shot, folks. Um, consider appointments to Gillum County Compensation Committee. Um, so to recap, uh, the statute states um, that the County Compensation Committee, which for the record, for those who are not familiar with what the Compensation Committee does, um, the statute basically sets out that uh, each county has a compensation committee consisting of three to five members who are knowledgeable in personnel and compensation management. And those individuals then are tasked, tasked with making a recommendation to this court regarding elected officials compensation. It is only for elected officials compensation, not for um, other employees in the county. So I just wanted to put that on the record because that sometimes trips people up. Um, currently we have two members, um, Eric Harrison out of Lone Rock and Nicole Schott of Mayville slash Condon. Um, we advertised the remaining committee vacancies in um, earlier this month and received six uh, letters of interest. So three from Condon, um, Sue Greer, Steve Schaefer, and Carrie Wade, and then three from Arlington, uh, Denny Newell, Benjamin Tucker, and Ashley Weatherall. And the recommendation given that we've got six and we can appoint up to three more um, is that we look at appointing three. Can I make a comment, and some of this has already been presented by Les and his email, and I have, I have talked to Les, but I had a number of concerns uh, early on when there was concerns over the other possible candidate who we know who, who it is, but, and, and those concerns were really about, um, well, 
I'm wondering if we need to reconsider the appointment of Eric because of similar concerns. And it really gets down to some people that have concerns, not just less, other people too, about the conflict of interest. And it really goes down to employees that have some sort of a report to an elected official and how that conflict affects them. So, and one thing I did was I, when we, when we were looking for some appointees, I went and talked to Kerry Wade and then this kind of bubbles up, bubbles up, and then it says, whoa, she's my yes. daughter-in-law. daughter-in-law yeah. And so I'm not <laughs> going to support her because right? I'd like to yes. see this be as clean as not, but I wonder if the court want to consider um, the appointment of Eric again. And that's really what Les's deal is about. And like I said, I've had several, not at the level of the, the other concerns, but certainly there is some concerns out there and it's more distant, you know, it's more distant conflict, obviously. But yeah, I mean, that. what I would say on that point is that Teresa's salary was already determined by the court when we created the position. And so there isn't... But, but I think it's more of a conflict. I mean, the conversations I've had are more of a conflict of who you report to that's an elected official that's affected by that. There's a perception a that it's a perception that, and I, you know, it really isn't anything he, that really his decision is, could be affected should by be her really position. a concern. And uh, you know, obviously, Eric and Carrie are absolutely fantastic options to have on there mm -hmm. with with their experience and stuff. And, and so it's it's just the perception of there is a relationship there to an elected official that might be, you know, this is what I want to do because. It will make me look better to my boss. I mean, I understand the perception, but I think it's, I think it's misguided. I think, I, I think if we started saying that anybody who has a connection to a Gillum County employee cannot serve, <laughs> we would, we would never. I mean, I, I am related. I mean, you guys know this too. You're in the same boat. I'm related to half of the county, and I married into the other half. Oh, yeah. So. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think we're, we would be setting ourselves up for this idea that then, you know, like I could make the argument, Nicole Schott's on here, and the school district is frequently in front of us asking for money. So does that influence that? I mean, oh, just yeah. about everybody, Ashley yeah. Weatherall, right, yeah. works for waste, waste management. management. We, uh, you know, we affect her potential employment here. Um you yeah. could you could literally go down with well, every it. single person and find a conflict. I yeah. get it. I just think that because you know there has been some conversation that bring it to the court. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. I, I just think and I understand their perception. But again, you know, we're a small county. We we're gonna I, it's gonna happen. <laughs> it's gonna happen a we lot, and we have to I we understand. have to consider what's the closest that is really like Carrie is. That's a little too close. So I get that well, too. And I appreciate her she kids would spend a lot be, of time in my house. Yes, they yeah. do. Uh, and she would she be would fantastic, be, yeah. to be clear. I mean, she's yeah. a thoughtful person. So but if you resign, we could have Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> no luck at this time, Sherry. <laughs> just, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, of the group, I will say, because I, I read Les's email, and I actually thought that the three that he put forward, I really thought he made a strong case for them. Yeah, I totally agree with that as well. I, I thought those were I probably Sue, have a different three, but that happens a lot. <laughs> Sue, Sue Greer, Diddy Newell, and Ashley Weatherall, which to me took a good section of different people in different areas and different backgrounds and um, I, I would all be a, an asset to Eric and Nicole. Like make, I a, just, make a really good group. I just, when I when I went through this and I studied this really hard trying to figure out, and, and I, you know, I've, I've talked to several of these too, but, um, and I served on the compensation board years ago because I was asked to because I was employed at waste management and I reached out to Ashley. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think she would be good, yeah. I, and I also think Steve would be good on there because he's got comp, he's got a complete understanding of elected officials and their compensation. And I and and uh, I don't know Denny, but everything I hear, and he's very qualified. And uh, and I really think he should be considered. And then um, 
I think Ben Tucker would be fine too because he's been in a management position since he moved to Oregon at two different trucking companies and for transportation situations. Transportation manager for a large company right now has been for some time. So there's some experience out there with wages and employees that, that I thought would be good options. Yeah, they're all good. I options. don't really know. And, you know, I don't know that I'm not saying anything wrong with Sue. I, I, I eliminated Carrie because of why I eliminated her on my pick. And then um, I don't know what Sue's background is since she's been, she's been a good friend and I know her. But I don't know what the background is there. The other, I knew their background and what they did. Yeah. Well, I, okay. My, my feeling is I think to try to get some balance geographically, my recommendation would be that we take one out of Condon and two out of Arlington so that there's some, there's some balance yeah. there. Um, I would agree with that. I, I mean, I, I will toss out a motion and if there is a second, then we'll go with it. And if not, then somebody else can make a motion. So my motion would be to appoint Sue Greer, Denny Newell, and Ashley Weatherall to the Gillum County Compensation Committee effective April 21st, 2021 through December 31st, 2023. And I will second. Okay. That wouldn't necessarily be my picks, but that's, that's okay because I mean, we know where we're at with it. So. Um, so it has been moved and seconded that we appoint Sue Greer, Denny Newell, and Ashley Weatherall to the Gillum County Compensation Committee effective April 21st, 2021 through December 31st, 2023. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, I'm not opposed. You're not opposed? <laughs> are you an I or a no on that? I am an I. Okay. <laughs> you got to commit, buddy, one more or the other. <laughs> then uh, the motion carries. Just wanted to get okay. it in there for Teresa so she knew what the vote was. Okay. Good. So, good. Um, good. and That's, we follow up with them with a letter letting them know of their appointment. And then Nathan is the um, staff for that. And so I have not heard when he's planning on scheduling their, um, their meetings, but that'll happen here in the next month or so, I imagine. Okay. Uh, 7.2 is uh, update on community corrections program transition. So this is just a verbal update that the Tri-County Community Corrections Board met yesterday. And um, just to recap, as we know, Sherman County is leaving the partnership. And so we are working on an IGA between Wheeler and Gillum County to um, continue to provide services jointly. Um, so Gary and I met with Christy Monson, uh, Gary and I and Tina met with Christy earlier this uh, week to kind of outline what Gary would like to see in the community, in the partnership. And so she is working on a draft IGA that I will bring back for us to take a look at and discuss and see if it's the direction we wanna go in. Um, but basically, as I think I outlined before, Tina would be a Gillen County employee. The budget would be run through the Gillen County's budget. And basically Wheeler County would be contracting with us for services to keep it clean. But um, uh, there's some things that Gary needs to work on, on supervision and hiring and firing authority and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which it, uh, he's working out with Christy. Okay. Um, so Sherman County was at the meeting yesterday. The thing that we need to do is kind of figure out, um, and it sounds, I missed the beginning part of the board meeting, but um, it sounds like they have figured out how to divide the assets, but there is still some funds that are sitting in an account. Um, that need to be divvied up. And so the board decided that the three county judges, which are all board members, would get together, come up with a plan for how to dissolve it, and then bring that back. And I'm, I'm thinking that that probably will come back to this court when we bring the IGA to make sure that you're comfortable. But I'm guessing probably what we're gonna do, because it's all state money that came in that has to be divvied up, is that we will probably just split it three ways to keep it, um, yeah. keep it easy. Okay. Um, so that is my update on that piece. Questions on that? Nope. Okay, um, let's move into 7.3, which is second reading and adoption of ordinance number 2021-01 and ordinance for special weed assessment in Gillum County. And uh, just to recap, we held the public hearings on March 17th and April 7th. 
and did the first reading of the ordinance um, during the April 7th meeting. Um, and so in order to adopt the ordinance, we would need a second reading and adoption. I move to have the second reading of ordinance number 2021-01 by title only. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we have the second reading of ordinance number 2021-01 uh, by title only. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, in the County Court for Gillum County, Oregon, ordinance number 2021-01, an ordinance for a special weed assessment within Gillum County. I move to accept the second reading of ordinance number 2021-01 by title only and adopt the ordinance. Uh, second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept the second reading of ordinance number 2021-01 by title only and to adopt the ordinance. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, 7.4, consider approval of changes to the ODOT Statewide Transportation Improvement Fund, STIF, grant plan. And Marla is here to give us an update. Okay, originally I tried to put everything in three projects. Uh, that makes just a little, it made, in my mind, I thought it would be okay. And that way I don't have to report on these tabs. <laughs> So ODOT did not care for that because I wasn't precise enough. So this is the revised one that I report on now with all the tabs. And it basically went over um, if things were changed for previously unreported funds in the 2019 and 21 biennium, adding program reserve projects, which we did, and shifting funds among, amongst projects, which we did not, but we were, we did the second one, so that's why we really need to have a re, a reboot from you, from the county court to know, so you know what would happen. So to break it down as short as I can, we now have the bus storage longevity, which was the gutters and the concrete, but it's broken down into two tasks and under one project. We'll purchase two of the vehicles, the um, auto access uh, Siennas, project operations and can continuity of services. We have it broke down on three tasks, utilities administration and the ninth to, through 12th grade student transit option that's mandatory through STIP. We have 140,000 left out of last biennium's STIF allocation and we need to put it in a reserve fund. And they said that we can use the funds. They just wanna make sure that it's rolled over and put into a re reserve and doesn't get lost in the budget. And then the Arlington bus barn, um, there's two options to it. We could survey, purchase land, engineer, project development, and then construction of a pole style building on the land that we would be purchasing on the north side. Or if the landowners, Gary Wild and Karen, if they decide that they would like to sell the whole space, we could sell the whole, we could purchase the whole lot. And they already have the center block building that we could just- Didn't they use. sell the center block building? Mm -mm. Not that I'm aware of. I thought he sold. Maybe he's just leasing. I thought he sold it. I think it's a lease because he told me when I talked to him last time, it was, I found some, finally got some good renters. So no, he wasn't interested, but I was going to check again since things have changed. That he'll, but I wanted to make sure it's okay. You know, I don't know how. I'll see what he says and I'll come back to you with that. Okay. I would guess if he sold it, it would all been together. Yeah, because he was going to sell me, well, actually where our bus part is parked outside, that's on his property. Our step in the existing building is on his property. Oh, okay. So we just need to purchase enough to put a, some a single vehicle storage. So the allocation amount for the 2021-23 biennium is $200,000. And then we have a carryover of 140 from the 2019-21 allocation. And I'm asking the court to approve the revised 2021-23 STIF plan with the revisions mentioned above. And so basically to be clear, this, we've already kind of talked and seen these projects. ODOT really just wanted them spelled out. Right. And, and we did add the one with the, um, the, the money, the reserve. The reserve. reserve. So it's, it's more 
probably more of a technical mm -hmm. fix really than it is any change, but ODOT needed something in the minutes that, yes. that we had seen it and approved of what Marla was doing. So she to. just wasn't running, running rogue. Exactly. Rogue crazy. <laughs> rogue crazy. <laughs> so yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple. The reporting is a nightmare, but it, it's, I could I could have broke it down into great detail for you if you really want, because each one of these little tabs has an outcome of performance and a criteria for every little task tab there is, and but don't and how much staff time that you spend. <laughs> but I'll spare you that. But if you're interested, come on down if you need something. No, to be <laughs> Questions for Marla. Do we, do we have a motion to I approve? I move to approve the Gillen County Statewide Transportation Improvement Fund grant plan as amended. Oh, I didn't Thank take you. enough breath before I started. It's, it's, hard. it's hard. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the Gillum County Statewide Transportation Improvement Fund grant plan as amended. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Got Thank it. you. Keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you. Have a lovely day. Me too. Okay, 7.5, which is the Frontier Telenet update that I added. I just wanted to let you know that we met, uh, the board met yesterday, and um, I think Sherry, you were on for listened in. Um, but basically, uh, we got updates on, um, well, we set the budget calendar, so the budget meetings will be taking place in late May, I think on the 20th. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, so we'll be doing that process. Um, Catherine Greiner is the county's um, representative. We have the three judges plus three lay people. And so Catherine was appointed as our person, um, our lay person. Um, we are moving forward with upgrades to the Roosevelt uh, Tower site. Um, it was falling into really bad disrepair. The ro roof was terrible and there was some problems with the electrical and it needs a generator. And so um, all of those things are sort of moving. I think the, uh, the electrician, I think was up there actually already. Um, and the generator is moving forward. And then the roofer, I think will be here in June to- um, it's been two years trying to get that all done. So it's good to hear- It's almost that. done. It should be done hopefully um, by, the beginning of the fiscal year, really, July 1, I'm hoping. Good. Good. Um, Cottonwood Tower is moving forward as well, um, which is the obviously the new site that will be out at um, Cottonwood State Park. And so the same, um, the same consultant who helped us with Roosevelt, the project manager, is doing the one at Cottonwood as well. That one's a little bit further behind schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the RFP is going out and they're planning on doing a site visit, assuming that the, they can get a hold of the landowner. There were some issues there that um, Judge Tobolskis was gonna try to help <coughs> bridge. Um, and then the other um, sort of more significant thing that was discussed was the idea of bringing in um, somebody to help do administration or management of the organization. And Lynn, Judge Morley is in, really interested in doing that. I think partially because he's, as the chair, is doing a lot of the work. <laughs> and so I think he's eager to find somebody to help him um, right. manage that. And so we are, um, I think uh, Judge Morley had put together a sort of a list of tasks and was soliciting proposals that the board will take a look at um, next month. Um, the other thing that I have been raising, I raised it at, this board meeting, and I also raised it at the Frontier 911 board meeting yesterday as well, is um, asking whether it might be time to look uh, to see if Frontier Telenet and Frontier 911 should be one board. And the reason I keep raising it um, is because there seems to be a disconnect. The three judges um, sit on the board for Frontier Telenet. And the Frontier 911 board is actually where the users are at. So the sheriffs are on the Frontier 911 board. They're the ones that actually understand what they need for the system, but they're not at the table of the actual network. Um, they don't have any authority over it. And so um, I think it would be very complicated to try to combine the two, but it's something I think that it's the least worth pursuing to see if it's an option. Um, like I said, there's there's just a lot of like the right hand and left hand don't always know. The sheriffs are going to day wireless and saying we need X, Y, and Z. 
And then Day Wireless is coming to the Frontier Telenet board to pay for it, basically. And so there's a disconnect between the users who are asking for more um, connectivity, which I totally understand and support, but they are they don't have to figure out how to pay for it. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect between the users of the system um, and who's actually running the system. And so it, I uh, there's a lot of uh, nervousness about that naturally because it would be a big change. But um, both boards at least said there's no harm in researching it. So I will be kind of working through what the different um, potential roadblocks Roadblock. to doing that would be. But I wanted to just raise that here so that you knew that that was something that I'm researching without necessarily saying it's definitely the way we need to do it. Um, there may be some other, maybe the solution is to broaden the frontier telenet board and put the sheriff's on it. I mean, maybe there's a different solution that we look at, but um, anyway, I just wanted to raise that. So you're not surprised if you hear that um, I am doing some research on that. Yeah. Questions on frontier telenet? Other than that, things are going smoothly. We, yeah. Yeah. No problems. We're financially solvent at yeah. this point. So what's the future look like? Well, um, I mean, it'll be interesting as the counties each roll out their own fiber plans. And because originally the legacy of Frontier Tunnel was really providing internet along with the 911 connectivity. And so, you know, Wheeler County made huge investments in doing, improving their internet. Sherman County, I know is working on um, some projects with I think GorgeNet that uses some of those legacy things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think partially it's gonna depend on some of our service providers here. And as they upgrade their systems or move over into fiber and are not using the wireless systems as much, then I could see a scenario where Frontier Telenet really does just become the backbone for the 911 and our emergency responder communications, just because I think that's where the market's going to go anyway, is when people can deploy fiber, they're going to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in which case, if it's just focused on 911 communications, it's a much simpler organization to run then because it's, yeah. it's just towers. But... But part of that's going to depend, I think, on some of our ISPs in the area and, and whether they want to upgrade systems and how long they want to stay on Frontier Telenet's networks and alternatives. That, I mean, having the Zayo fiber line go through Wheeler County, I think, changed a lot of things. Um, I've heard that there's that Oregon Telephone um, has, I think it's an E-rate contract to bring fiber in through the other side, through Grant County into Wheeler County mm -hmm. to service the schools. And so if that happens and there's a loop of fiber that's running through all three counties, they may, we may stop using the microwave system for those purposes. And in which case it would really, I think it would really change what Frontier Telenet's mission is then and really focus it on 911 and emergency communications, which makes sense because that's yeah. really right. the most, I think, yeah. what it's really doing the, the critical right. stuff that it's right. doing, which it needs to continue to do. So anyway, okay. other questions? Let's move on to uh, 8.1, which is uh, consider approval of resolution number R2021-05, a resolution declaring a drought in Gillum County. So we have, um, if you've looked outside, we are in, uh, <laughs> we have not seen rain for some while, a while. So um, how this typically works, we did one of these last year as well, is Gillum Soil and Water Conservation District and State Water Master. Um, basically the Soil and Water Conservation District Board, I think that last week and um, are recommending that based on the precipitation at this point that the county go forward with uh, approving a, a drought declaration um, and the water master concurred with that. And basically how this works and why this is necessary is our declaration then gets forwarded up to the governor's office with a request that they then declare a drought for our county with the feds which then allows our producers here to access um, certain, certain relief funds and grants. 
um, from state and federal dollars or programs. So this is, um, I think, pretty housekeeping, really, based on what we actually what they're actually seeing with uh, conditions on the ground. Um, I get on that Eastern Oregon Legislative Caucus call on Tuesdays, and there's a number of counties going down this road. But the legislators were asking that if any counties are doing this, that we move that on to them. Does that help with the governor, or are we fine? Will this just get there and we'll be fine with it without doing that? So what we could do is well, obviously on the east side, that's where all the problem is. So. Yeah. So uh, um, well, it's west side's struggling as well. I mean, they're a record. They won't struggle as much. But well, they won't. Struggle. But but yeah. they they realize in their record. Yeah. yeah. So what I think we could do is um, technically, I think it's the governor that has to make that declaration. Her, I mean, she's the only one with the authority, but. If we decide to move forward to, with it, what we can do is um, we can CC our legislators on the communication idea. to the governor, and in that way, they at least can push. Or they right. will know yeah. that it's occurring um, and can weigh in. So that that's an easy. We can just see them on the cover letter um, and attach the resolution with it when we send it. Perfect. Questions on this one? Do we have a motion? It's your turn. <laughs> I can do it, but it's your turn. <laughs> I'm glad you guys have worked out a system. <laughs> so I would I don't want to take all the I don't see the <laughs> oh, okay. So this would be the suggested motion language. Yes. yes. Move to resolution R2021-05. As presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution number R2021-05 as presented. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries. Oh, you had a lot of oops behind that. <laughs> okay. Let this woman be curled up in a ball somewhere. Oh, let's go into announcements and next meeting. So the next meeting, next regular meeting will be on May 5th here in Condon at the courthouse. We also, I'm just going to put these on the record first and then we'll get to everybody's updates. Wanted to flag, but I want to double check the dates. The first budget committee uh, meeting will be on Monday, May 3rd at 8 a.m here in the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Second one is scheduled for May 10th, um, which if that goes long would spill over into May 11th. So I wanted to put that on the record for the public if you're interested in watching. That's on our calendar, isn't it? Yes. Yes. If you're interested in watching uh, the fascinating work of creating government budgets, that meeting is open to the public and you are <laughs> welcome to come and participate. Right. Yes. Um, also, just to flag, the 10th is the day that we typically go through the grant applications for the competitive grant. So if you submitted an application and would like to come watch sure, the county um, budget committee contemplate your application. You are of course welcome to come and um, listen in. And if the budget committee has questions, answer those. So I, I have a question. Sure. So did I not accept something? No, we don't, I don't think that we got something that had it come to our calendar. You're gonna have to type it in there. We can ask Nathan to, Nathan staff said. So much easier if they just. <laughs> I agree with Kelly. Uh -huh. we'll, uh, we'll ask Nathan and Kelly to send out a, a calendar invite. Okay. Um, but both of those meetings start at 8 a.m. Um, and let me see if there's anything else on here that I need to flag. Okay. Mine are in there. <laughs> just like that. Manner, manner. Um, I think those are, <laughs> look at you. Um, I think those are the only uh, meetings that I wanted to flag. So let's go on to announcements. Sherry, what do you got going on? Um, at our NORCOR meeting, um, the uh, we haven't uh, had our, oh, we did have our budget meeting, sorry. <laughs> we did have our budget meeting. And um, 
there's some proposals um, on how to um, assess the counties. Um, our increase would be 1% in what they've proposed, which um, of annual increase over what's um, been. Is that decrease anybody else or is everybody? No, else? everybody was getting an increase. And we, um, Sherman and Gillums would be 1%, and then um, based on the percentage, the river and, and Washington County would be. Be more because we're the budget's based on um, the county's usages of the facility, and they also were going to um, send out to the counties um, a request for um, a piece of the American Rescue Plan Act monies that each county got based on what their um, costs and expenses have been for PPE and um, what that's, you know, what, what's been required at NORCOR for uh, the COVID-19 response. So we'll probably be seeing that soon. Um, and if anybody's interested, the packets for the meetings for all of our meetings are on the NORCOR website. So anytime you want to know what's going on um, and what's coming up, you can go to the website and see what's on our agendas. Um, the administrative group, which is Molly Rogers for Juvenile um, and um, Jeff from Juvenile, Dan Lindhorst, for the adult side and Sheriff Mowry have done an excellent job of bringing us back to a financial um, you know, understanding and the, the whole financial uh, accounting system has been um, simplified so that it's, um, it's they're, they're just doing a really good job in what they're doing. We're still talking about what a new administrator might look like and what that job would be. But from what they've been doing as long as I've been there, it's, and, and I, I think the rest of the board would agree that um, they're doing a great job. And COVID-19 has not affected NORCOR. Um, it's been clean and, and so we're proud of, of what's been happening there. And I have CAPCO Friday this week. So that's kind of what's going on. I've been trying to attend some other uh, meetings when I can. I had listed on Frontier Telnet for quite a while. So I was really glad to have time to do that this week and pick up some other things. I haven't managed to get to the Eastern Oregon um, meetings, but I need to do that too. Hear what they're interesting. Yeah. I, I do I do read what's coming out, good but, feedback. but to hear what they're saying is to, different than what you read. They take you through the legislative detail mm -hmm. piece, and right now it's really interesting because all the bills that are out there and they're talking through, and, and AOC's on there, Gina's always mm -hmm. on there. Yeah. And Rebecca Tweed, and then Anna Cliff Mintz has been on there, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, representatives from Wyden. Yeah. Merkel has been on there at times. So it, it kind of... Uh, goes through the legislators and then through the commissioners. Each commissioner gets to make comments or concerns and talk to the legislators directly on that call. So it's mm -hmm. kind of nice, that's how nice deal. I'll have to take time for that. That's it. Great. Pat, what do you got? Oh, man, there's been quite a few things. So um, I don't know if everybody knows, but the garage was building sale is complete. So oh. you know, Kelly said the taxes were paid up last week. So, that, sure. that deals off into the port's hand. I did have County College last Thursday and Friday, and it was on economic development. It was oh, really interesting. Cool. And just along those lines, maybe we could schedule a work session sometime in the future and talk about economic development. That it's really interesting with the ARP or AR, <coughs> uh, a, at the act coming out now. There's so many buckets of funding out there that. And almost every bucket that's out there has something for 
broadband and something for mm -hmm. infrastructure and something for housing, something for small businesses. And there's all these buckets that have a lot of the same type stuff. There's a lot of stuff with USDA. So it was, it was a really interesting session with the uh, county college and a lot of what's going on with economic balance. So it's really kind of heated up because COVID, COVID relief and trying to get things to move it's on. ARPA. ARPA. I had American to Recovery Act. American Rescue Plan Act. Rescue, Rescue Plan Act. <laughs> yeah. ARPA. ARPA. So the work yeah. session, what, like, just to talk about economic development, you know, I'm new to the court and we can kind of throw some ideas around the business about a little bit, you know, like that rather than type a long, a long court meeting, maybe we could have a session and just kind of see where we're headed with the different parts of what's going on in Yellow County. And are there some things that we could go out and pursue that, that oh, yeah. especially Sounds like good. with housing and broadband, there's so many, yes. you know, things out there. Yeah. That, and I'm not sure I would without having some discussion how we move forward or want to move forward with some of that stuff. Sounds good. I like it. Would you like, I was thinking, I remember when we adopted the strategic plan, we had talked about revisiting that. Would you like it that should to be part of, that be part of this discussion? Big part of county college and what, what the counties have and use for a strategic plan. And I don't really feel like, which I communicate, yeah. I don't know what yeah. we're there with. What we have with a lot of other What a lot of other counties have. Okay, so yeah, we can do a strategic plan slash economic development discussion. And, and I don't know, maybe we, I don't know how quick we want to do that. Obviously with ARPA, there's some urgency with right. some of this stuff, right. but we have budget and a lot of things going on right now too. Um, that, but, it's just, but like you say, it's like with broadband, we want to get, we want to get all of our ducks in a row so that when the money comes, we're ready. And so I think that's a good idea. Typically what we do with our work sessions, if you're open, if you guys are open to this, we could do, sometimes what we've done with work sessions is since we will pick the Wednesday anyway that we're going to meet. That's probably. And so, I mean, what we could do maybe is look at scheduling an afternoon work session. So we could hold court at 10 and then maybe just at one, you know, take a break for lunch. Um, uh, That'd be good. Yeah. Or after, I'm assuming we'll probably have some longer executive sessions with the negotiations moving, but I'll, Teresa and I will work together and try to figure out which state might, and, and Lisa, depending on how, how your CBA negotiations are going, to try to find a date that we could maybe do an afternoon work session. Sounds good. Um, okay. So that, uh, I was on the North Gillum Public Health board meeting the other night, kind of an interesting meeting. And with all that, North Central did not have a board meeting, North Central Public Health did not have a board meeting in April because the chair was on vacation and really didn't have much on the agenda, but there's gonna be a big agenda in May because of that. And partially I think spurred on by our feasibility study and pulling out of there, I started getting phone calls last week regarding from <laughs> people involved with the, Health district wanting to know That's what good. was going on in Gallup County. And I am on the agenda for May to give them an update about what we're doing and, and what we're looking at. And I've kind of, you know, told them it's not, nothing fast is going to happen. It's going to be a slow process and not get real yeah. excited. But um, that, that being said, I did sit down with Holly this week and talk to her for quite a little while. And, and uh, I've, I've talked to Dave, and there's Definitely some stuff going on there that um, we're gonna have to work through. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to the board members with the North End and, and have a visit with them. But so that's going on, and and uh, it's kind of out there because we put it in public meeting, and then I think uh, Bailey's been doing some work that has asked some questions that have generated some questions. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's going on. And um, uh, other than that, I guess you saw that we got the IGA from the port. Just this uh, morning. This, yeah. I, this morning. I, I um, read it yesterday. So it's kind of out there ready to go. And... Yeah, I will um, send it over to our attorneys to make sure there's nothing, no red flags. And then if 
assuming they say it all looks good, then we'll put it back on the board's agenda. Other than that, I think that's been on some ASC committee meetings and stuff, but especially transportation, human resources, and all of that. <clears throat> Great. Um, well, I think I've already um, covered. We had um, Frontier Telenet, Frontier 911, and Tri County Community Corrections meetings yesterday. This was a full day of meetings. I guess. Um, I already covered Frontier Telenet, already covered Community Corrections. The 911 board um, adopted or approved the budget. Um, that budget go, is actually part of Wheeler County's budget. So it's, it's, a, it's just the preliminary thing. Wheeler County will actually put it in their budget because um, there were some questions about hearings and stuff for that. And that's why it's structured the way it is. It's part of their budget. Um, Still doing a lot of AOC stuff as well um, on their membership um, committee and then their budget and finance committee um, and then the normal ledge committee and those other related committees. So uh, that is part of our strategic plan to be engaged. So Pat and I are both doing that. Um, let's see, other than that, let me see what else we've got going on here. Um, Jeff Schott did send over the, um, the RFP for the Holland and Sons demo. And so that is moving forward. Just, I wanted to flag that for you guys. That is moving. And I think that is it for me. Um, any other announcements? So, um, if not, we have an executive session that is scheduled for 1230. And so what I'm going to do, um, and that's when our labor attorney will be joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and recess us until 1230. We'll come back for that. Um, I wanted to let the public know, technically that the regular session will still be open, but we are not planning on coming back and doing any business. So um, you're welcome to stay if you want to hear me formally adjourn it, but you're not going to miss anything if you um, if you leave before then. Um, and so the court will take a recess until 1230 and then um, we will come back. I'll open it up and we'll go into executive session. Okay, we're recessed. So I will go ahead and bring us back into our regular session and we'll go into 10.0, which is executive sec uh, session in accordance with ORS 192.6602D to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. The Gillen County Court will now meet an executive session pursuant to ORS 192.6602D, which allows the court to meet an executive session to consider information to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. Representatives of the news media and designated staff will be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to vacate the courtroom. Representatives of the news media are specifically report on or otherwise disclose any of the deliberations or anything said about these subjects during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. In the executive session we'll, we will return to the audience in the public virtual meeting room. So two bits of housekeeping. Um, one, as I stated before we went into recess, county court will come back into our general Session, but we don't have any business, so we will come back to adjourn. Um, so anybody who is on the Zoom, um, you're welcome to stay if you like, but uh, you're not going to miss anything if you if you dial off. Um, the other thing that I need to state for the record um, here, and I will do so in the executive session as well, is I have a conflict of interest because my dad is the weed master and is therefore represented by the union. So I will be opening and closing the executive session, but will not be participating in the session. Um, and so with that, uh, we will uh, be going into an executive session, which is a separate room. And once we conclude, we'll be back out. And I'll ask Lisa to go ahead and do that.
So we are back from the executive session and it is 1243 and I will adjourn the meeting.